Hi, I'm James Fairbanks, and I'll be talking to you today about Algebraic Julie and Applied Category Theory Framework. So I think of scientific computing technology as existing along a spectrum. At the one hand, you have arbitrary code where you run a program that implements a simulator of a mathematical model of a physical system. And so there's this long chain of mental effort that goes from turning your domain scientific understanding of the system into math, into models, into code. At the other end of the spectrum are computer algebra systems, where you have explicit representations of the model as a mathematical expression. And you can use algorithms that produce analytic solutions to solve these systems. But lots of systems don't have analytic solutions, and writing code manually is hard and time consuming, so people develop modeling frameworks. And these tools have this explicit representation of the model, but compute numerical solutions. And one of the tools that these partially symbolic computing tools use is graphical representations of their models. For example, digital logic circuits, signal flow um, and control flow graphs, quantum electrodynamic Feynman diagrams, or the ZX calculus for quantum computing, or as we'll see, uh, compartmental models in epidemiology. All of these formal scientific diagrams are little graphical programming languages where you can describe physical systems and then generate uh, simulators that will answer questions about those physical systems. We're introducing Algebraic Julia, which is a framework for building on top of these mathematical formalisms inside the Julia programming language. So the system, which is primarily implemented in a Julia package called CatLab, has three layers. At first, there's an algebraic theory where you encode your understanding of your physical systems, like the rules for how your systems behave, into a universal algebra. Then there's a layer that takes that specification of the theory and generates three um, interdependent syntaxes. A formula notation that looks like mathematical formulas, wiring diagrams, which are these graphical syntax, and embedded domain-specific languages that are custom tailored to the scientific theory you're trying to work with. Then you have the instance layer where Julia types represent uh, variables or systems or whatever the concepts are of your, your scientific theory. You pick Julia types to instantiate that theory, and then you do the numerical computing in Julia. So CatLab is built out of lots of components, including five DSLs, Theory, Syntax, Presentation, Instance, and Program and we'll see them throughout the talk. The theory is where you encode your understanding of the kind of the kinds of systems you're working with. Syntax is a generalization of expert, so this is an expression type that allow you to manipulate expressions in the theory. A presentation provides a specific example of that theory, and instances map theories to Julia types that actually do numerical computation. And then the program macro lets you express formulas in a, a notation very similar to Julia programs. I want to start by introducing the category of natural numbers. So it's uh, categories are a, an abstraction of how kind of mathematical functions work. Uh, type systems in programming languages like Haskell and ML are based on category theory, all of functional programming is. And the idea is that you have objects, and these are going to play the role of types, and HOMs, which is short for homomorphism, which are going to be the maps between these, these objects. Like how programs have input types and output types, and you can compose programs by passing the output of one program as the input to the next. And so categories just have uh, these four components, objects, HOMs, and identity 
hom for every object. And if you have a function, if you have a hom from A to B, and then from B to C, you can compose them to get a hom from A to C, just like how sets and functions work. Another thing that represent that is a category is a graph where the homs are the set of paths. So the objects are vertices and the homs are paths. And you can concatenate paths, that's the composition rule, if you have a path from A to B and then a path from B to C, you can compose them into a path from A to C. So if you have in those in your mind, kind of categories are like sets and functions, and also categories are like paths in a graph, you'll get the right intuition. So we want to take this theoretical object, the category, and we want to instantiate it with Julia types. We're going to introduce two types, or three types really, finord, finord func, and finord vec. And so finord is just a number n. We wrap it in a struct so that we can use dispatch. And then we introduce these structs for storing the morphisms, finord functs, which are kind of lazy. They store the function as a function object, and you call that function to apply the map. Or finord vex, which are eager. You store the function as a vector from the indices into some codomain. And because uh, Julia functions are not typed by their domains and codomains, like they would be in a statically typed language like Haskell, we need to store the domains and codomains explicitly in these structures. So once you have a theory, like a category, and a struct, you can make an instance where you say that finord and finord map are going to form an instance of a category. And here's how you calculate the domains and codomains. Here's how you calculate the identity what's the composition rule. And for here, um, you check that the domain and codomain match with the assert, and then you compose them as functions and, and calculate what the right domain and codomain are. So in order to express uh, more interesting programs, you have to move into a, a more powerful theory, which is symmetric monoidal categories. And these are categories with tupling. You can think about having a pair of objects, and that's still an object. It's monoidal because there's this product type where you can take any two types and construct a pair. So we present a, finite, a finitely presented symmetric monoidal category here by writing down a list of objects and a list of homs, along with their domains and codomains. Then once we've generated this category by providing a presentation, we can build expressions. So expressions in a symmetric monoidal category are generated by the primitive morphisms you declared, the uh, O times, like a Cartesian product, um, and then composition, which we represent with a dot. So this morphism here in the top right, F times G composed with H, is going to be a map from pairs X, Y, into x. Beneath it is shown a diagram, and the reason you need this, this product is so that you can think about, you can build these structures that have kind of parallel wires and sequential wires. So you can think of calling f and g, and then taking the outputs of f and g and piping them in as the inputs to h. So in a category, you can only make pipelines. In a symmetric monoidal category, you can make directed graphs of computation. So then this the app program syntax is a syntax that looks like Julia code. I mean, it is valid uh, Julia ASTs, right? It's a macro. Um, and what it says is, I want you to interpret the following function definition as a morphism in the category presented by, in this case, P, where the domain is X cross Y, and the codomain is, is, is whatever the type of Z is at the end of this program. And so this gives you kind of a procedural syntax for describing these morphisms, which is more convenient than writing the ASTs by hand or drawing these diagrams. One of the main reasons why we want to do applied category theory is that the theorems of category theory come with these pictures where you're like, it's like 
kind of ancient Greek geometry, where the goal is to construct things using a series of rules. And so when you get this diagram, uh, which provides a construction, you can read off the diagram an algorithm for constructing the thing the diagram depicts. So here were three constructions that we use are initial objects, co-products, co-equalizers, and push-outs. And these generalize the idea of the empty set, the disjoint union of two sets, co-equalizers are like equivalence relations, and push-outs are like unions. The method of proofs from category theory are naturally constructive, and constructive proofs lead to algorithms for computing the thing they, that they construct. That's why we uh, want to do programming with pictures in this sense. Our real-world application is going to be simulating a pandemic using petri nets and differential equations. So our model is going to have three components, or three cities, and the disease is going to start in one city and then spread linearly down a chain. So there's going to be a compartment model for each component and then a flow from component to component. So here's an example constructing the SIR model. So SIR is defined as a two-step process you have susceptible people S who receive the transmission of the virus from infected people I, and then infected people can recover into state R. This can be drawn using a formalism from chemistry called Petri nets. And this is called the SIR model because there are three states, susceptible, infected, recovered. From that Petri net, you can compute a vector field, which provides you a differential equation in terms of the populations of people or the uh, kind of the chemical concentrations. Then from that vector field, you can compute trajectories by solving them using Diffie-Q.jl. So we're gonna build increasingly complex models and then apply this pipeline and it's fully automated. So here's where we define our theory of epidemiology we have objects for the different types of populations, S, E, I, R, and D. And then we have HOMs for the different types of processes, transmission, exposure, illness, recovery, death, and travel. And one of the nice things about these algebraic theories for modeling is that we're encoding our domain understanding of the science. What are the rules of epidemiology? We're encoding those rules into a data structure. And it's not just a data structure, it's a data structure that has a logic built into it, a mathematical framework around it. So we encode our domain knowledge into this structure, and then we can type check our expressions. The only expressions that we're allowed to make in the theory of epidemiology are going to be expressions that are composed of these primitives and are composed in an appropriate way. We're going to use a category theoretic construction called decorated cospans. And I just want to show you here that the way decorated cospans are designed is via these category theoretic diagrams. And we can read off the diagrams the algorithm for how to compose our petri nets. So I'll illustrate an example. You want to compose the transmission and recovery processes. And you're going to have this pair of cospans. So you can think of these dots as variables in the system. So I have two variables in the transmission system. I have two variables in the recovery system. I'm going to glue them together along this boundary that says that the second variable of transmission is the first variable of recovery. The construction in decorated cospans tells me what to do. So I take my transmission system, my recovery system, construct the disjoint union, and then I take an equivalence relation that says this variable and this variable are supposed to be the same. And that gives me this three variable system in the bottom right. The, decor the decorated cospan construction tells you how to glue petri nets together to make big petri nets. And you can use exactly the same framework to glue dynamical systems together to get complex dynamical systems out of simple dynamical systems. So here we're gluing the, we have a model of 
transmission and a model of recovery. We take the disjoint union, which here is the direct sum. So we get a system of four variables. And then we say that variable two and variable three are supposed to be the same. So we'll use a superposition principle and add uh, the derivatives of those variables. And that gives us this three variable system where the u dot two is the difference of two terms. So this is how we give kinetics to our petri dance. So we went from a theory of epidemiology to petri net coast bands to dynamical systems. And functoriality, this idea that like you can compose and then convert to petri, or you can convert to petri and then compose, gives us these constructions. So we love using types in programming languages because they help us ensure correctness of our code. And the same is true when we build these algebraic theories, which you can think of as type systems. So we know that any system that our theory of epidemiology will allow us to build will be valid. It'll, it'll make sense from a domain knowledge perspective because we encoded our domain knowledge into the theory. So here are a bunch of systems that can be expressed in that theory. Transmission recovery, so that's SIR, then SEIR, and then SEIRD with travel, where people can leave from, so susceptible, infected, and exposed people can leave the city, but recovered and deceased people cannot. So any formula you can make now becomes a primitive that you can compose again to make bigger formulas. And so you can get these large, large systems in your epidemiological model. And one of the nice things about CatLab is that the data structures that represent these programs are just regular data structures in Julia. So you can write regular Julia functions to manipulate them. For example, if we want to take the n-fold um, n-fold product, so powers of a system. We can just define, you know, we can use fold and compose and repeat. Um, this is regular Julia. This program, this is not Julia code. It's syntax for describing morphisms in the category. But then after you end and get out of this macro, you're back in regular Julia. And so we can build this big wiring diagram, which describes the process, and then compute what was the Petri net that goes with that process, and then simulate it to get trajectories of the disease and see that kind of each region uh, peaks one after the other. So I want to compare this to functional programming languages, which are guided by the idea, modern PL theory is that you have one category of syntax where you describe programs and another category of semantics where you interpret programs. And typically the syntax will be like programs in the programming language. And then the semantics will be set theory. So each type in the programming language becomes a set, a mathematical set. And each program in the programming language becomes a mathematical function uh, between two sets. Here, we're using uh, what's called behavioral semantics. And it's the same idea that you have a category of systems or designs and a category of behaviors, which might be set, might be uh, rel, the, the set, uh, category of relations. Um, and the idea is that you, there are ways you can compose systems to build big systems out of little ones. And then you want functorial semantics that what the systems do, their behavior, it can be expressed in terms of the behavior of the components. And that's behavioral semantics. So there are lots of modeling frameworks, and they all kind of use graphs plus a mathematical interpretation of that graph. So like Bayesian networks from probability theory, neural nets, we already talked about Petri nets, databases use relational algebra, optimization problems can be expressed this way, Markov decision processes, uh, dependency resolution, you know, just make files um, are a type of modeling framework. So we always have this graph structure with additional information. And the goal of 
algebraic Julia is to connect all the modeling frameworks with all the modeling tasks to build modeling, model specific tools for the scientists. So it'd be that calibration, selection, comparison, verica verification, validation. And instead of writing all pairs, you know, for all modeling frameworks, for all modeling tasks, write that a tool that does that task for that framework. We want to be able to factor that through a common set of software abstractions that live in algebraic Julia. And so we can minimize the amount of code we have to write. So here's the thing we're extending right now, uh, which is called C sets or categorical data structures. And uh, you can think of these like how the relationship between a database schema and a database instance, you know, the actual data that goes in the database is that you have some schema that describes what are the parts of the data and how do they relate to each other. And then for every part, you have some set of values. And for every arrow, you have a function between those two sets. So for example, let G be this category, the G sets are graphs. So you have a set E of edges and two functions into the other set V of vertices. So that can be implemented in CatLab as the theory of graphs, which is a presentation. And then CatLab can generate a Julia type that instantiates this categorical construction called C sets. If you want to extend your, your graphs to property graphs, where edges and vertices take properties from some other set, like they could be edge weights and vertex weights, you can naturally inherit uh, the theory of property graphs inherits from the theory of graphs by adding an object for properties and these HOMs, V props and E props, which assign properties to vertices or properties to edges. Our PetriNet example is a categorical data structure. Given here, you have some states and some transitions and input output relationships between the what states are inputs or outputs of which transitions. And then these are petri nets with initial value problems. So every transition has a rate and every species has an initial concentration or an initial population if you're thinking epidemiologically. What is a petri net initial value problem? It's a choice for every object in C, a set of things of type C. So a set of species, a set of transitions, a set of arrows, for inputs and a set of arrows for outputs. Inputs go from species to transitions. The outputs go from transitions to species. Uh, you have to pick a set of rates and initial concentrations. And for every transition, you pick a rate. For every species, you pick an initial concentration. So other things CatLab can do is that it can do planning. So given a CAD model of a Lego construction kit, you want to compute a plan for how to assemble that Lego um, design. And so uh, the plans form a symmetric monoidal category, and you can do kind of computer algebra techniques like to reschedule that plan to get a more parallel plan. You can also generate SQL queries. So as we talked about, like you have a category that represents the schema, you pick sets that the data lives in, a data set that conforms to that schema. And then there's a category of queries that you can use to analyze that data using the primitives of relational algebra. And so CatLab provides a syntax for undirected wiring diagrams, which are good for relations. And Al there's a Julia package, Algebraic Relations, um, that supports this query language and will compile your queries, which you draw these pictures, um, it will compile them to SQL that can be run against. Uh, we target Postgres mostly. So again, our goal is to connect all the different modeling frameworks against all the different modeling tasks through software abstractions that, built on, that build on general algebra, generalized algebraic theories uh, which encode scientific knowledge about how the systems work.
and we connect to things like petri.jl, diffeq.jl um, to do the solving, and then um, also connect up to solvers that can exploit hierarchical structure. That's another area we're working on future work. Um, right now we can specify models hierarchically and do model generation, but we also want to solve them hierarchically. We think that we can get acceleration out of that. So I want to thank the Algebraic Julia team, Evan Patterson, Micah Halter, Sophie Libkind, and Andrew Bass. And uh, thank you for your time. I'll take any questions. We are very active on the Julia Lang Zulip and have a category theory channel there called catlab.jl. Thank you very much.